Hi guys, I'm Chris. And I'm James. Welcome to the Better Out Than In. For the Roaring Twenties. Yeah, we've got we're quite fancy on. It's a New Year's Eve, and as we're about to go on to the Twenties, mm. we thought we'd bring back the Roaring Twenties. The Twenties. Prohibition, Great Gatsby style. Twenties. You know, everything. Twenty. 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 Yeah. Everything is twenty. Maybe twenty. I'm twenty. Uh, true, it is twenty. It's twenty. You know, that was pure blind luck that I picked a whiskey that was 20 years old. You only literally just put that together. I did. I saw the mechanics working when I was saying 20. <laughs> well, that's what made me think of it. If you hadn't said it, I still wouldn't have recognised the fact that we're doing a 20-year-old whiskey in the 20s. Yes. It's, yeah. it's good that we are well prepared for this yeah. episode. <laughs> yeah. Always a top-notch class here. Yes. Hence, the bow tie and the tie and the suspenders. I ain't no big city lawyer. <laughs> I'm not, like not going to snap them. I did that earlier at... Uh, <laughs> Made me sensitive. Leave that for later in the night. Yes. It's a different video. Check out a different website. <laughs> for those who want to pay an early admission fee. No, um, definitely not. So, <laughs> so we're going to do a, as I said, 1920s Prohibition theme. So we're doing a Prohibition themed whiskey. So just everyone kind of knows what Prohibition is and a bit of the history behind it. I thought mm-hmm. I'd give everyone a bit of a... I found this quite interesting when we were doing the research on it. So a bit of a history lesson um, or education bit about it or some information. And so it was a constitutional ban on production, importation, transportation, and sale of alcohol, not the actual consumption. Mm-hmm. Just everything you were producing and moving and selling it. So technically, if they caught you drinking and you weren't paying for it, it's not illegal. You were fine. Yeah, I didn't register that. Um, so it's from the 1920s, 1920 even, hence what we're doing this for, to 1933. And obviously had a huge impact on the US identity. So it did such things as... NASCAR was actually developed from the bootleggers' souped up cars. Yes. I, I always love that fact. The fact that. Yep. I was like, what is this stupid sport where people just drive around in a circle over and over again? I'm like, it, it's, it kind of has its history, linkage, origins. History. Yeah, from yeah. the 1920s and the souped up cars to get away from cops. Yeah. Um, it's always great as well. Like, I, I don't know if anyone has seen, you know, old movies or anything like that. And you see the kind of cars that they were using, and they were like, yeah. you know, the. The, um, the old Ford T, whatever, like the tiny T wheels. Yeah, 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 exactly. Like kind of just, stuff. just the ones that were incredibly, um, not, not, um, what, what is the opposite of aerodynamic? Yeah, yeah, basically yeah. bricks with wheels. Yeah, exactly. Kind of thing. So imagine having that souped up and driving around corners and stuff. That, yeah. And like wheels literally like that thick kind of thing. Yep. What you put on a bicycle a these bike. days. Yep. Imagine the cornering, right? You'd be no. tipping that. And like having, but they had to do it. Having casts of the like, yep. alcohol in the back, that stuff would just be... And they were doing the runs yeah. up and down and, you know, outrunning the cops yeah. and everything like that. And it was just, yeah, it's an incredible history about it. Yeah, it'd be quite cool, actually. Yep. Um, so as that, there was obviously also the increase of acceptance of women drinking in public, weirdly enough. So pre-prohibition, it was seen as immoral for women to be drinking in public. And then mm-hmm. because everyone kind of went to the speakeasies and underground bars, it didn't become as acceptable because everyone was doing something illegal. Yep. Um... And then when, speaking of speakeasy, it was the speakeasy and the impact of them on the American co- uh, music culture, particularly jazz, like jazz flourished at that point in time, mm-hmm. and also helped in early racial integration, weirdly enough. I never would have thought of this, again, either until I did the research, because it was usually black jazz musicians playing to a predominantly white crowd. And right. so that wouldn't have happened until this kind of underground clubs developed. So again, not something I never would have thought of. I knew about the NASCAR one previously. I didn't yeah. know about these two facts. Yeah, no, not at all. Yeah, around it. Um, actually increased California's grape production by 700%. And what I love about this is they're not allowed to produce wine, but there was this legal loophole to produce wine bricks or wine kind of things. <laughs> and they did, it. basically it's just semi-solid grape concentrate that's alcoholic. They did this advertising campaign that like played on kind of Christianity of turning water into wine. And they said, don't add this brick to a jug of water and leave it for 20 days in a dark place. Otherwise, it will turn water into wine. <laughs> I just love that kind of plan. Yeah, don't do it. Otherwise, you could get drunk. Otherwise, like, you could. Yeah, no. Well, so they're kind of like going, no, no, no. You're not meant to use it for this, but secretly use it for this. And yeah. this is how to do it. It can be used for yeah, that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but even though that took off, the wine industry in the US actually took a massive dive in this period. Like people uh-huh. actually left the US who were wine kind of growers and stuff to go to other countries where they didn't have this issue. But uh, prohibition was a big thing back in the day. Um, I think partly World War One somehow fueled the idea behind it. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah, it seems like prohibition increased diversity in some weird roundabout kind of way. And it in- so it decreased obviously drunkenness, obviously, and the, um, kind of the violence or something went on for it to begin with, and then it kind of just tapered out, so it didn't have the benefits for too long. Yeah. Is what the research kind of shows. So it was kind of useful, but not. And then, given the Great Depression occurred and everybody just wanted to get drunk because well they had nothing else. 
it, it, it kind of got overturned eventually. Yeah, it had to. I yeah. mean, uh, yeah, people were doing it anyway, so... Yeah, exactly right. And then people obviously rallied against it. So one of the official whiskies of Prohibition, I suppose it was Canadian Club, and Al Capone was one of their... Like, in Chicago, was one of their largest um, clients from Canadian Club, which is actually just right across the border. Yep. Um, and so if you've ever seen the TV show Broadwalk Empire with... Uh, I can't remember that creepy looking dude's name. Steve Buscemi. That's the one. Yep. Um, when he imports stuff, it's Canadian Club, right? And that's supposedly what really was. Yeah. There's, you can go to the Canadian Club distillery, distillery and I think they have like a tour around Prohibition and how this helped them grow and become big. That's really cool. Yeah. Yeah, that seems cool. Um, so yeah, obviously we're doing the 20 year old for the Roaring Twenties uh, for <laughs> New Year's. Love that I just whipped that out. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. Light bulb moment. <laughs> Um, and this one is uh, barrel blended and matured for 20 years. So what barrel blended actually means is that uh, it's batched um, of the unaged spirit uh, and then it's blended together before they put it in like the white oak barrels. So that's also known as uh, blended at birth. So they add so they add all different batches in together. Yeah, so yeah, gonna, yeah. This isn't a batch that is going to age by itself or a batch that's Okay. No, Interesting. So never, like during the distilling before. process, as they, as they come up with different batches, they just yeah, sort of just put it all together. Put it all together. They're not like yeah. keeping them specific or unique. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And usually during the uh, distilling process is where a lot of different batches can get their unique flavors. Uh, and so that's why they're sort of blending it all together. Yeah. A bit more consistency out of um, you know, the product that they're going to get. Yeah, I'm thinking for 20 years as well. Yeah. Right? That's yeah. going to... Yeah, exactly. So, um, uh, blended of rye, rye malt, corn, and barley. Um, this one is only of a limited supply, with each bottle uh, numbered individually. Um, but it is a regular. Yeah, I love that. So, limited supply, but enough to supply everyone who yes. wants it. So we'll basically make a whole bunch of different batches. We'll put them together. We'll uh, barrel them, and then we'll bottle them. But we'll keep doing that consistently, but these bottles are unique. However, I've never seen this in a pub or a bar, no. but yet I've seen Canadian Club like everywhere. I've never seen this one. Like this was something we had to look for to actually get. Yeah. So it obviously is a bit more unique, but not that unique. Absolutely. And especially here in Australia, it, it could be a much, much more popular overseas, but here in Australia, uh, it's the first time I've ever seen it. So Yeah, I've uh, seen like the very basic model of yep. Club, maybe the next level up eight-year-old I think yeah some, something like that yeah. I think they do a, a whole bunch of different ones yeah um, but this one fairly standard 40% ABV um, 750 ml bottle which is a little bit unique um, there's yeah. not too many that do 700 the or, or a liter, right? yeah. yeah yeah exactly I think um, you know I mentioned when we did the Habiki episode that was 700 a um, little bit unique in and of itself that yeah. you know it's, it's around sort of those marks yep um, this one got a 92 in the Jim Murray uh, whiskey Bible um, good score. which is a very yeah. very good score um, anything right. above you know the 90s uh, you know you're yeah, in for a, a pretty right. good, um, you know, whiskey. Good. Yeah. 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 Um, and uh, being that it is 20 years um, uh, aged, uh, expecting a lot less of that oaky flavour to come through. Um, obviously less than, you know, like a 10 or a 12. Um, and expecting a lot more of a more well-rounded uh, whiskey in this one. Um, very smooth. Right? Yeah, it's Canadian whiskeys are always very That's smooth. That's what I was thinking. So it's going to be super smooth. Exactly. So I'm, I'm expecting, you know, like velvet on the tongue smooth uh, <laughs> experience. So, yes. And so kind of like the other one that we did, the Pike Creek, JP Wise at Pike Creek, that was kind of meant to be like an after dinner dessert yeah. sipper. Mm -hmm. I think this is kind of aged like that at age. This is kind of meant to be like that as well, attractive for that kind of crowd or that kind of drink. How do you open a box? I'm very close to ripping that. <laughs> he does it in one swoop. Jump. I want to put that. No, I'm going to put that. This one is pretty though. Oh Jesus! So nice bottling though. Like it looks. <laughs> it looks good. It's yeah. just slightly more difficult to get into. Yeah, it looks quite nice. I mean, for the Canadian clubs, they do have that sort of. Um, you know, standard uh, black, um, was it neck with uh, gold trimmings and stuff like that. So uh, they do give that kind of regal presentation. Uh, this one, fairly similar. It's got the gold writing with the black neck. Um, you know, screw type cork almost. I think it's bone uh, with white on the label. Uh, you know, very nice presentation. Mm. And the imaging, the gold. Yeah, it's got the logo and everything. Oh, hold on. There we are. Mm, bit weak sauce. I think that's a synthetic. That's oh. very synthetic, yeah. Oh, I love that sound. Oops. Oh, all good. It seems like we're celebrating the new year yeah. with a bang. Well, 
Well, he wasn't that much restraint in the Roaring Twenties. No. I believe, so. No, exactly. We'll give him a new restraint today. Well, and I, I've got to say, I don't think that... Uh, this is using a glass. Yeah, back then, um, they would have been experienced such a nice, well-rounded whiskey as what we are today. Yeah, so. probably not. Yeah, a bit more bathtub-esque um, back then. Yeah. But luckily, we have um, very big bathtubs that uh, produce very nice uh, whiskies. You remember, this is unique. Unlimited. Unique and limited. Um, to the first one million clients. <laughs> mm. now. There's a very nice smoothness to it. Um, I was say, that's what I light fruit, uh, like pear. Almost before you get any kind of smell, like all you just notice is smoothness. That is probably mm. the best description. Yeah, the initial impact you get. Yeah, it is very light fruit. I was going to say, yeah, definitely a pear. Yep. I mean, even like a peachiness to it, but like a, a very like light fruit. It's the lusciousness, the kind of the juice of a pear. Is what yeah, it that's what I think of. Mm, quite nice. Mm. Um, not a lot of complexity on the nose. I got to say, like it is what it is. It's nice, sweet, a little bit fruity, a little bit that that sort of pear note. Vanilla bean is what I get. Okay. I get vanilla, and there's not just normal vanilla. Like if I eat ice cream, you know, when they get the specks of vanilla in the ice cream. Mm, yep. That's kind of what it reminds me of. I don't get. As you said, too much else. Yeah. Yeah, I'm finding it difficult to pull that uh, vanilla out of it. Oh. Is this spicier than I, I thought? I know when you describe it, it was a rye, so it's unmalted mm -hmm. rye and malted rye. Yep. It's a combination. Yeah, you definitely notice that. It's zesty. Yeah. Mm. Very much so. I'm not appreciating this or enjoying this as much as I initially thought I would. Um, yeah, I mean, given, given it is a 20 year old, um, I'm finding that it is probably not as, well, I, okay, so there's a couple of things, probably not as complex as it probably should be for something that's aged for 20 years. Usually you get a lot more interaction with a barrel. Agreed, but I was expecting this from a Canadian whiskey. Right? So Being a Canadian whiskey, whiskey yeah, exactly. Whiskey, like, so oh, yeah. there's that, but then also, uh, you know, it's, what is, it's only 40%, right? I believe so. Yeah, 40%. Mm -hmm. um, and so you're getting a lot of spice from the rye and you're getting a lot of edges oh. in it as well. Yeah. And so for a, a Canadian whiskey, you're expecting this really smooth roller coaster and you're getting quite a lot of... Jagged edges. Jagged edges, yeah. yeah. And, and you're getting like a zestiness on the... Yeah. I'm, not, I'm not saying that the zestiness is bad. I actually find it quite interesting. Um, it's not what you expect though. No, not, not at all. all. When, when you go like, I'm having a 20-year-old Canadian whiskey, I like... I'd almost swap the Pikes Creek in this in terms of what I would expect mm. in some ways. I'd expect like a much younger one to be this. As you said, jagged is probably the best way to describe it. And this that one to be really smooth and silky. Mm -hmm. um, but it's not as well. Or even like a Pike Creek, but keep the um the, the complex parts where it's got an underlying, you know, um, vanilla current. But it's also edges. got yeah, it's I also think, got yeah. like a zestiness to it which creates an interesting flavour. Whereas this, this is um it's not bad, but you're getting rice spice, you're getting pepper spice, you're getting zestiness, you're getting a whole bunch of very invasive flavors, and only a hint of smooth vanilla. So yeah, it's, it's not it's not a, it's not a very good balancing act. No, it's very very much a hint. Mm. Right? Like you can taste it. I can I can definitely taste it now after having like three or four sips of it and lean it air a bit, etc. But it's not even close to being complementary. No. To the rest of the flavor. No, like I'm, I I find it interesting. But at the same time, it's disappointing. No, I definitely agree with that. Mm. I'm very disappointed about this. Yep. I was thinking this would be a perfect one to add to my infinity cask. Yeah. It'll work in well with it. Because I was going to potentially put some of the pipe creek in anyway. Yep. I don't know if I'd want to put this in. No, I don't, I I don't think this plays well with others. No, <laughs> no. Unless you're going for a very rye-related whiskey. Yes. This definitely does not play that well yep. with others. Yeah, so, so being that it is sort of like a mixture of, um, you know, your rye, your malted rye, um, your barley, um, I would expect a little bit more sweet smoothness to it. Yeah. I'd be interested to know if they removed the unmalted rye out of it and just had the malted rye mm. and the barley, would it be that sweeter, smoother one that we're kind of used to, for, like, say, the Archie Rose yep. and things like that, where yeah. the unmalted rye really gives it a lot of sharpness. I yeah. think that's what we're expecting with it. I was expecting with this is kind of the sweetest smooth. 
Yeah. Why not this? Yeah, just kind of missed the mark a little bit, I think. Yeah, definitely. Um, to kind of similar to what the JP Weiser one you said, where it's kind of like in Ontario, Canada, down in Windsor, like opposite the border to Detroit, so it literally is right across the border. This is kind of the same one. And so when JP Weiser, I don't know if they got into financial difficulty, I don't remember, but they actually merged with Hiram Walker, which was the guy who ran this. And so it was like two of the three largest Canadian whiskey producers merged together, which is, I imagine, a unique experience. I can't imagine like, the two of the three greatest Australian whiskey guys merging. You, you don't hear that kind of stuff anymore. Japanese. Scottish. Yeah. <laughs> and so it's kind of, Japanese maybe these days, right? Because like Suntory Bean was huge. But I know what you mean, but like back in the day, like this was like 150 years ago, like 1858, this started up. Yeah. And it got blended, kind of like the two companies together like 50 years later. You wouldn't have expected it back then. No, no, no. not at all. Not at all. So it's kind of got a very similar um, story to JP Weiser in some ways, I said like it, it kind of distilled in that area. And as I mentioned earlier, if you go to the distillery or the area, there's a museum for it. And it's a museum about prohibition and they show you some of the tunnels, how they used to That's get cool. stuff out. Because at the time it was not illegal to produce it in Canada, but it was illegal to ship it or something like that. So they were basically the two laws worked in opposite ways to each other between Canada and the US. So they basically yeah. played off each other and so he, they could just export it through to the US. Um, and at the moment, because obviously there's such a big roaring 20s or prohibition tile whiskey, they've done a special release. They're doing like the Chronicle release series. And so they're doing like, as in Canadian Club, unique whiskies. And so they did one last year and they did one just this year called the Docklands, uh, the Docklands one. And it's a 42 year old whiskey that was kind of um, inspired by the Docklands of the Prohibition who were taking this stuff on. 40 at the time. 42, yeah, 42 That's years old. Such a weird number. I know, I think the other one they did for the first series was similar kind of age, like 40 years old Canadian whiskey kind of yeah. thing. Yeah. I know, it is quite odd. Um, you don't really, often, one, you don't hear age. It makes like me think there's more of a story behind the uh, specific 42. Like, why did they pick 42 as opposed to 40? They didn't mention it when I, when I looked about it. They just said, yeah, it's the unique... Um, Chronicle release number two, the Dockman, 42 year old Canadian whiskey. Mm. So I don't know, and impossible to find in Australia, essentially, hence why we're doing this one and not that one. Yeah. Um, but given I didn't really like this one as much as I hoped, I'm glad I didn't get the 42 year old. Yes, <laughs> yeah, it, yeah, it might be like that. disappointing. Yeah. yeah. So I'm going to say a lot more disappointing than I hoped. It's not like bad. You know, this is what it was like in the 20s, you know. <laughs> the roaring 20s, not the 2020s, the 1920s. You know, everything was just a little bit more disappointing. Well, it does feel like we're getting that way with the 2020s. Is like everything's a little bit more disappointing in the world than what it was. Well, maybe we need to move more away year. from, like, the rise, because we finished off the advent calendar with the rye. Right. Um, we, we had a brief break with the dark matter. A brief and break, and went on to another rye. Maybe rye just isn't our, our flavour. Maybe we need to move on to something a little bit. We've got a rye coming up for Australia Day, potentially, or around that period, hopefully, end of January. Hopefully it is as good as the whiskey root rye. I think it will be. Yeah, we'll see. Yeah. But anyway, guys, that's all we have time for. Uh, good luck with your ventures in the roaring 20s. Yep. Happy New Year's year. for everyone. Happy New Year's from us to you. Yep. And we will see you in 2020. Yeah. See you later, guys. See ya. Bye. Hey, thanks for joining us at the Better Out Than In. Remember, if you like this video, to like it, share it, and subscribe to our channel. If you have any feedback or suggestions, leave us a comment or drop us a line. The Better Out Than In supports the responsible service and consumption of alcohol. If you or a friend would like any more information about this, please visit drinkwise.org.au or your local alcohol support organization.